Welcome to my July month wrap up. You might have noticed that in my June wrap up, I read a few more books than average thanks to all that work travel I was doing. But for my half up this month, I've read fewer books than average. That's kind of the point of averages, right? They always even out in the end. I only have three books to talk to you about for the first half of July, and they really run the gamut from a horror to some chiclet to an epic World War II story. I have a little bit of something for everybody. And of course, I'm diving into some fresh stuff for the second half of July. Let's dive right into hearing about what I've been reading. Home Sweet Home again. Uh, the first book I read for the month of July, I actually started back in June on my flight home from Phoenix. It small fit in my carry-on and as I've talked about this author before, kind of the queen of romantic suspense, so a great like plain book that I didn't have to be uber focused on, but I read Tailspin by Sandra Brown. This is another one I got sent in that box of Goodread giveaway wins when I won her other book. I actually finished this a couple of days ago, but I've been struggling to figure out how to talk about it. In typical Sandra Brown form, there's events, there's suspense, there's that romance, there were a couple of steamy sex scenes, but the central drama of this book is built around two patients who have a blood cancer that is going to kill them. It's rare, there aren't treatments, and there's stuff going on to see if one of them can be saved. So it's really become sort of a Sophie's choice. Only one of them is eligible for the thing that will be saved. Save them and they have to pick one. I'm a cancer survivor. Um, I've had cancer, so I find reading these stories really hard and triggering for me. That's why I had a hard time figuring out how to talk about it. Also why this isn't my favorite Sandra Brown. It rates lower in my book just because of that emotional connection that I have to that part of the story. At the same time, it's as reliable as Sandra Brown ever is. As with pretty much anything of hers, see it, pick it up, read it, great beach read, brain break, brain candy, that kind of thing. It's been a great reading, napping, lazy kind of dreary day. The next book I finished is called The Winter People by Jennifer McMahon. I originally found Jennifer McMahon, surprise, surprise, in a Goodreads giveaway win last year when I read her novel, A Drowning Kind, and loved it and determined that I would pick up more books of hers. I was planning on waiting until October and be a little thematic, which I'll talk about in a second. But I happened to see this in a neighbor's little free library a couple of weeks ago and couldn't resist going ahead to pick it up since the opportunity was there. Jennifer McMahon lives in Vermont and she writes wonderfully creepy horror fiction. There are weird things that happen. There's creepiness that's never quite fully explained. It is in part of this one, but it's definitely one of those spine tingling, just, I wouldn't say fully horror. There is some scary stuff but just creepy reads that gives you the chills in the best possible way. If that's the kind of thing you're into, I highly recommend checking out some Jennifer McMahon. This is the second one of hers I've read and I feel the same about both of them. I really enjoy that spine tinglingness. I'm interested in reading more come October because I do occasionally believe in theme months and what better time to read some bone tingling chili stuff uh, other than Halloween season. So I will probably pick up more of hers around then and you'll hear about them now. But until then, this was very satisfying and I can't wait to dive into my next read. The next book I finished this month was actually my April book of the month club pick. Uh, you're probably going to be seeing some backlog there too because I don't always read books as soon as I get them. This one is called The Good Left Undone and it's by Adriana Tricchiani. I really enjoyed this one. It's a World War II book, but it's not a World War II book like you're used to seeing. It really centers around two people. This woman, Domenica, who was born into this little village in Italy, Via Reggio. She grew up there, but she kind of flouted some things and ends up getting punished by her priest and sent, she's a nurse, and gets sent to Marseille to be a nurse in a convent there. And as World War II begins to impact them, they close the convent and they sent her to be a nurse in Scotland instead. It also follows the story of her daughter, Matilda, who at this point is an elderly woman. She is not doing so well. She's dying and she is now very worried because she feels like she has not shared all of her stories and all of the family stories and history with her children and grandchildren. If she doesn't do that before she dies, it will all be lost. During the story, we really see the flashbacks to her mother's story 
kind of told from Matilda's point of view, but not always, because of course she's telling stuff that happened before she was born and sharing those stories. Learn a lot about this family. As I said, this is not a World War II book like most that I've read before. I do love some good World War II historic fiction. This is not exactly like that because Domenica and her family are not directly involved in the war. And it expects that you have some knowledge of what's going on. It uh, refers to the Fascisti. It refers to Buchenwald. But it doesn't really explain what that is. So it expects that you have some base knowledge of just world events at that time and that the single use of a word here and there is going to really evoke that. And the word does impact them. Parents go into hiding, Domenica gets moved around, she falls in love, it has an impact on her husband. But World War II is not the central thing in this book. The central thing in this book is really Domenica and her family and their journey as it is. We move from Italy to France to Scotland and back to Italy, and I really like how the author uses words from those dialects or languages dropped in, maybe in the middle of an English sentence or, you know, speaking to English nurses. She'll use words from the native language of the country they're in, so it really continues to evoke that flavor instead of getting out of your head that that's where you are. You get that flavor, you get that feeling throughout. I did cry a little bit at the end. It was just a lovely story. I think another reason I really like this is I did live in Italy for a year in college, and there are a few times they mentioned the city that I lived in. See if you can figure out what that was. Uh, as well as the region that I lived in. Oh, sorry, Kona's knocking the camera. As well as the region that I lived in. And I visited towns not very far from the beach town where Domenica and Matilda grew up. So there was a little bit of nostalgia there for me as well, going, I know that place, or that sounds familiar. And especially with the Italian language sprinkled in, I don't use it anymore, so I'm very rusty. I still think in it occasionally, a little bit at least. That really brought up some good, fond memories for me as well, which is another reason I really connected with this book. So all in all, uh, Adriana Trigiani, The Good Left Undone, definitely well worth the time and investment to read. This next book I read in the month of July, I read pretty quickly. It took me two days. My sister said 10 minutes. That was a little bit of an exaggeration. I've been really struggling with figuring out how to talk about this book. So this was not a Goodreads giveaway win. Shocking, I know. Uh, nor did I buy this one myself. My sister is long time's best friends with this author. She calls her her bestie, Anne Kemp. And Anne lives in New Zealand. I, however, don't love electronic books and previously Anne has only been published on Kindle, Amazon, that kind of thing. Earlier this year she released her first, I think, four books in print and my sister bought them and mailed them to my mother, another sister, and I so that we could all finally join her on this journey of Anne's authorship. I reviewed one of my Goodreads a couple of months ago, uh, her newest novel, Sweet Summer Nights. This month Guys, after that last book I read, The Good Things Left Undone, I had a major book hangover. I just could not get into anything else. I picked up two other books that I'd been dying to read, kind of started, just couldn't get into them. And I knew I needed a good brain candy, brain break, palate cleanser to reset me to dive back into reading like I normally do. Call it the metaphysical Tylenol and water for a hangover cure, if you will. So I went to my to be read pile and I went through it to find a book that met that description. And I came across Anne Kemp's Abby George series, which begins with Rum Punch Regrets. So Rum Punch Regrets originally was published in 2012. It's about 10 years old. I believe it is Anne's first novel and I think Anne's a subscriber here, or at least my sister says she is. So Anne, I'm sorry. I, as I said, I've really struggled with this, but I need to be honest with my opinion, even if it might make my sister mad. My sister is a one woman cheering section for Anne. I've been hearing about these books for a really long time. I told my sister I started to read this this week and she was begging me to do special feature posts for Anne on my bookstagram and on my YouTube. I made no promises. I don't currently have any plans to do that, but I am going to talk about the book I just finished reading. And here's the thing, I really wanted to love this book. I just didn't. It definitely fit the bill for that brain break, brain candy, brain vacation palette cleanser that I was looking for. 
Heather often describes Anne's books as a Hallmark Channel movie in book form. I did not find that to be true for this book, at least. Maybe more Lifetime. I like the story. The plot is good. The characters that she builds, they're sort of wacky, sort of off the wall. They remind me a lot of Janet Ivanovich and the Stephanie Plum series in that way. It just didn't grab me the same way that Janet Ivanovich does. And I think a big part of that is because this is Anne's first novel and it's 10 years old, so I'm sure that some of that has gotten better. I also felt like parts of the plot were repetitive, parts of it didn't quite make sense, that it could benefit from a little more editing. Don't get me wrong still a whole lot better than I could do if I tried to sit down and write a novel today. But I just think it's not quite there yet as much as I really wanted to love this. I gotta be honest with what I think. I am gonna read the rest of the series, not immediately, but the next time I'm ready for a brain break, brain vacation, I will pick up the second book in the Abby George series. As I said, my sister did send us all four books that Anne now has in print. I'm excited to see how Anne's grown over the last 10 years as an author and if that changes because I do find a lot of times even favorite authors now that if I go back and read their first book or even second book that I don't always feel the same way about the author because those early works I mean they're still learning they're still honing their voice finding their craft and I mean we all do that we get better at the things that we love with practice with patience with time so I'm hopeful that this is a case of that as I said, it's still a decent beach read. It's still that good brain break, brain candy thing that I was looking for. I'm ready to dive back into some of those more serious novels that you'll hear about in the second half of this month. Just not my favorite book of this month. Not my particular cup of tea. I'm saying this knowing that it's probably going to upset my sister that I am not fully bought in but I thought it was most important to have integrity and to be honest about my thoughts, even if it's not necessarily what everybody wants to hear. And I would say the same thing about any other author had they written this book, not just the one that's a friend of a family. So anyway, Abby George, Rum Punch Regrets by Anne Kemp. If you want to read something that's like a Hallmark movie or a Lifetime movie in a book, this is it. We'll see what else Anne and Abby George have coming for us in the future. Here's what I want to know from you for this half up. I am going to Greece in a couple of months. I'm so excited. It's been a few years since I've traveled internationally. I know that's true for everyone, but even before COVID, it's been a while. I'm doing a little bit of something that's completely out of my comfort zone and going on a sailing yoga retreat. I'm not usually a big fan of group travel. This is my first yoga retreat, my first sailing vacation actually on sailboats. I did a cruise many, many years ago just the one. I am flying in a few days early and I have a few days on my own in Athens before I go meet the group and maybe one day in Athens afterwards. I'm so excited. But what I'm interested in is what favorite books you have that have Greek themes, Greek characters, Greek history, Greek anything. I'm ready to immerse myself in the country that I'm going to to read tons about it and really be a little thematic for a little bit just so I feel fully prepared to enjoy my vacation and get the most out of it that I possibly can. If you can't tell, I'm super excited. I can't wait. I've been making plans, scheduling tours, reading guidebooks, and figuring out my wish list of things to do while I'm there. Uh, always, of course, leaving some extra room to explore. So please put your recommendations in the comments below about those books to read. And if you have any sites that are must-sees outside of the big must-do tourist ones that everyone always does, please go ahead and put those in the comments below. I am always looking for new, undiscovered, hidden gems when I travel. Until then, stay tuned and keep reading.